So Anthony, I have a question Let's, uh, be, while we're gathering those. Um, Santa Cruz is a uh, coastal t uh, county and uh, one of our concerns uh, as planners is uh, sea level rise. So um, can you talk about how that might uh, uh, affect our, our future transport network and sure. maybe what, what the rail network would uh, do to address that? Well, the good uh, news is that you don't have a lot of tunnels uh, on your line. I think the places that are going to be really hard uh, hit uh, by um, uh, climate change uh, superstorm type effects will be places uh, like New York City um, and uh, others that have a lot of underground electric uh, railroads. Uh, um, you know, there's still, there's still one tunnel between Manhattan and Brooklyn that's being rebuilt uh, and the line is closed uh, uh, from the Superstorm Sandy, I think that was two years ago uh, now. And um, uh, when you have a, a coastal rail line that's above ground, well, you may have washouts and, and bridges uh, to worry about, but those can be Re, re put back into place uh, actually more easily than uh, uh, highway uh, redevelopment. I mean, rail infrastructure is uh, pretty resilient um, because it's uh, usually got a, a narrower footprint. Um, um, it uh, isn't mm -hmm. fully uh, sort of uh, uh, um, concrete. Well, uh, that's, uh, uh, some just... of it might be, but uh, the, the less concrete you have to replace uh, on the system, the more it's about gravel and uh, okay, you know uh, wood trestles and that sort of thing. The easier you can put it back uh, as and when you get uh, uh, sooner or later uh, uh, one of those uh, big big uh, climate events. Uh, that, that happened. But uh, um, we're, we're all going to be uh, struggling uh, with this. I live one meter above the water level in Vancouver and I wonder, uh, some of my architect friends tell me that um, you know, uh, new buildings that are going to be designed, high rises, all of the electrical and service uh, infrastructure is going to be five stories up uh, in them. They're not going to put them at the ground level or in the basement uh, anymore. I imagine there will be design adaptations for infrastructure that will also allow it to be sort of uh, uh, flooded uh, without it being completely destroyed. Okay, thank you. So we're, questions are rolling in here. Uh, okay. Next one, with short haul between stops and no high speed rail potential, which I think maybe you might question, um, how do we adapt existing railroad to support short haul commuting? Sure. Well, um, y you know, uh, those blended networks are able to mix uh, short trains that serve local stops and uh, uh, trains that uh, go through at higher speed. That's going to be part of the uh, innovation that the Caltrain uh, part of the high speed rail is going to uh, uh, develop. Uh, you know, figuring out how to run, they're electrifying the Caltrain between San Jose and uh, the Transbay Terminal and they're going to run even more frequent Caltrain services which have local stops that would be similar to what your uh, distances are in this corridor as well. And they're going to figure out a way to thread the high-speed rail service at least every 15 minutes uh, for an hour through that corridor uh, as well. Um, that's going to be a, a, an innovative uh, approach with infrastructure and operations. We're going to learn how to do that, whether you would transplant that directly to um, uh, the uh, line that you have here in this county, I don't know. But I think that you should definitely be starting to build uh, uh, local uh, rail uh, service with frequent stops that can go at least to uh, a connecting point uh, to start so that you've got the opportunity to connect in with that network. Uh, you have the chance to get your um, local rail going at least as far as uh, Gilroy, hopefully, where um, the uh, Caltrain service uh, currently goes. That's the first uh, sort of connecting aim you should have. Whether people will ride it all the way up to San Francisco or not is another question, but you'll be able to get all sorts of trips from this county into Silicon Valley uh, through that uh, uh, option. Okay, we've got quite a few here. Sure. Um, do you think it is likely that federal regulations will change in the near future to allow shared use of light rail type DMUs with occasional freight on regional rail lines such as ours? Um, well, uh, the current uh, solution to that, which may or may not work for you here, is known as temporal uh, separation. Um, in uh, New Jersey and uh, even down by San Diego, there are light rail, uh, diesel light rail and electric light rail uh, operations, transit operations. Um, that use these tracks and at night uh, in the off hours is when the freight uh, operates. That might not 
thrill people who live along the, uh, the rail corridor to have freight trains running at night, but that's the easiest way to start um, doing this. Uh, if you're going to run uh, the trains uh, at the same time on the same tracks, uh, I think you're going to have to uh, spend more on equipment uh, that is crash worthy, the, uh, uh, that, that can handle, withstand uh, higher impacts. Uh, you know, those Japanese trains, there's a reason why they've had zero fatalities. Uh, they don't have to, uh, they never crash into each other because they're all going the same speed and they don't have freight trains uh, that they're going to crash into uh, either. My best uh, hope is some of my uh, work in Washington showed that uh, there is research going on um, that the U.S. government is uh, supporting on so-called crash energy management systems so that you don't have to add tons of steel to just make the train um, sort of crash proof that it can sort of hit a very heavy object and uh, not be deformed at all. That requires a lot of weight. But the crash energy management option might say, well, you have crush zones at either end, uh, the vestibules, the washroom, you don't want to be in there at the wrong time if it's the crash <laughs> zone, but uh, uh, that there are ways to sort of take parts of the, uh, the train and have them um, sort of take the, uh, the brunt of that kind of impact. That could, might be if, if uh, the engineering designers out there come up with good crash energy management zones, that might be the solution to allow lighter weight uh, uh, train, uh, passenger trains and freights to operate. But that's probably about five years away. Okay, here's one that we get asked often. I think you did start to address it towards the end of your talk, but how does Santa Cruz County population density compared to other uh, communities with passenger rail service? Well, uh, as I showed you, compared to that uh, French town of about the same size, uh, you're half the density. So uh, uh, that means that uh, you're going to need to do some uh, uh, development. But the good news uh, is that trains tend to be placemakers. Uh, unlike uh, airports and uh, highway infrastructure, people actually don't mind living close, like within walking distance of uh, a train station. So as you develop this rail corridor, and as long as uh, you uh, uh, have the land use right around the stations, you will increase density. It's just a, a, a law of... Uh, uh, nature, if you will, where uh, wherever you've developed rail, um, one of my students went over to Japan and looked at you know how they do uh, rail-oriented de development, and he came back and said, well, you know, there that's the norm. They just you know any time they it, it expand or enhance the rail system, they just have more development around those stations. So I think that your um, development efforts of this uh, rail line will actually build the density that could then take you to the next level with um, uh, more intercity uh, and higher speed trains. Um, okay, this is, uh, you touched on this this morning. Talk about China's maglev train. Is it the future of inner city rail? Well, the Chinese took every um, technology they could get their hands on um, and uh, bought it and put it on their test benches and reverse engineered it to, to see what, what they would work with. And those, 1,000 to 1,200 mile uh, runs from Beijing to Guangzhou are not maglev. They're being run with conventional rail. The, the Chinese figured out uh, a couple of things. The, uh, the maglev um, is uh, got about a 50% energy penalty. Uh, you know, when you, when you double the speed, uh, when you get up to uh, sort of aviation style speed on a maglev, the biggest problem is air resistance. And unless you're gonna go even wilder in your engineering fantasies and create sort of vacuum tubes uh, that uh, those trains can go through, you're going to spend most of the energy uh, that's being used just getting through the, uh, the atmosphere at ground level. There's a reason why planes like to go as high as they can. It's thinner up there and uh, they don't use as much fuel at high altitudes. That's not a, uh, maglev will be elevated, but it's not going to be elevated that far to uh, get rid of that. And even in China, they, they couldn't, uh, you know, some people say, well, they're, they're able to just tell people what to do and build things, whether people like it or not. Even they found when they built their maglev link from Shanghai airport uh, to Pudong, which is about halfway into the center of Shanghai, that they could not take something like that and bring it into the heart of a, a central city. 
because people on an elevated uh, platform. I imagine it would be like an aircraft coming by at you know, 12 or 20 feet above uh, the ground. Uh, the, the noise is uh, unbearable and uh, the uh, wind and air effects are uh, too much as well. So the Chinese figured out that, that maglev was just an energy hog and unsuitable for being built around built up uh, areas unless you put it all in tunnels uh, along the way. And so they decided not to go forward with maglev and build those high speed uh, uh, conventional rail lines which are at a, uh, 186 miles an hour uh, able to handle these long distance uh, trips uh, as I suggested. Okay, um, this is relevant, I think, to, to our branch line. Does the high number of trestles, grade crossings, and shared road rail right-of-ways limit the potential for high-speed rail? Um, maybe it does. I mean, uh, uh, the, the more um, crossings, the more uh, uh, sort of interaction with uh, road and other uh, people wandering around, you know, biking and walking along the tracks, uh, uh, the harder it's going to be to run uh, more trains faster uh, along it. So um, the question is how many crossings and which sections can you uh, work with? Uh, is it possible to consolidate? Um, you don't uh, want a sealed, and uh, you don't need an entirely sealed corridor like the Japanese model if you go for the blended system. But the higher the speed generally, um, the fewer uh, interfaces you're going to want to have with, uh, with other modes of transportation. So that you kind of have to build into your medium term plans as you uh, expand uh, uh, the speed and or uh, throughput on, uh, on this. Uh, um, but uh, those are trade-offs that can be managed incrementally. You know, you can sort of start uh, at one speed with one set of uh, crossings and uh, uh, then you can work your way up uh, over time if it seems appropriate. Okay. Um, don't the huge distances in the central U.S. preclude having a real national rail system? Well, certainly not for freight, but I think if you meant passenger, uh, um, you know, again, uh, uh, the, the Chinese are looking at uh, two-day trips from uh, China to Europe, uh, going through, uh, you know, uh, Mongolia and the Central Asian uh, republics, and they're looking at two-day uh, trips uh, to go from uh, uh, the west coast of the U.S. to uh, to China. That may take them uh, a few more decades uh, to go forward, um, but uh, that suggests that uh, you know there's uh, room for uh, a day plus uh, 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 an, uh, you know a couple of nights or you know almost two day trips that would work uh, on this continent as well. I'm not saying that should be the priority. Um, it depends what you think the future is going to be like. If you think that we're going to you know, perfect uh, hydrogen fuel cells or cold fusion and have unlimited energy um, to, uh, or biofuels will work for uh, aircraft, then um, maybe we don't need uh, a plan B for a national rail passenger uh, system. The more you think that uh, energy and climate is going to need more efficiency in uh, moving people and freight without oil, as uh, the book suggested, uh, the more you want to keep those options open. So Amtrak from San Jose North to Seattle is horribly slow. We talked about this this morning, I think. Yes. Uh, <laughs> how can this be improved? Is it necessary to go with high-speed rail? Would it be cost-effective to build passenger-only lines that are not slowed by freight? Well, it's about figuring out how to expand the track capacity. You know, maybe it's not going to be the Chinese-style bullet train. Uh, you know, uh, it would be maybe five hours from here to Seattle if you did uh, the full Chinese uh, uh, style um, or, or the dedicated corridor. But um, you could add more tracks uh, for conventional rail um, and uh, have uh, the ability to sort of speed up the existing uh, trains uh, in rough proportion to that investment. That's why I said the solution is really figuring out a new model to build tracks uh, in this country. I mean, the, the Merced to Bakersfield uh, trunk of the California high-speed rail that's still being thought about, if it's built, that's going to be the first passenger rail uh, track, new passenger rail track in this country for intercity purposes that's been built in over 100 years. We just haven't built any for a very long time. So it's time to start thinking about other places to build that and how to do it. And uh, that's why 
um, having a, a model uh, that's invented here will spread if it works, uh, I think. It'll spread to other parts of California, it'll spread to the West Coast, and I think other places will want to follow California's lead, like they have in many other uh, innovations in the U.S. Would a light rail system like London Docklands, uh, driverless and partially elevated for level crossings, et cetera, work for us here? What about privacy concerns for adjacent residents? Sure. Um, uh, this morning I mentioned the, the scene from the Blues Brothers movie where you know they're next to the Chicago L in that apartment and it comes by and the bed shakes and the whole apartment is disrupted. Uh, you know That's what people think about when they think about elevated rail going by. Uh, and it isn't quite that bad, but those issues do uh, exist. Vancouver has an automated uh, light metro uh, system too, the SkyTrain, and it's all elevated because uh, there's no driver so you can't have people wandering in front of the train, uh, to, uh, so there's no crossings, it's totally separated. Um, and those areas that the train runs along um, are dead zones. People don't want to develop and live along those uh, elevated tracks. The station areas get development, people are happy to be walking distance from the station, but um, we haven't figured out a great use for the land under the, uh, the tracks or next to those uh, tracks. So I would say that um, keeping the trains at ground level has its uh, advantages, even if you still have to have uh, drivers. Uh, uh, there's, uh, you know, that's good uh, local uh, uh, economic activity. You can't uh, outsource the drivers and the money that you spend on them will stay in your local economy, I think. <laughs> okay. Um, does the auto industry fight this resurgence of rail? Didn't they buy out trolley cars early on? Well, the, the auto industry certainly had a, a history of uh, misbehavior uh, in uh, transportation policy. Uh, the first uh, class that I uh, always start my students with in Transportation uh, 101, I showed them the Who Framed Roger Rabbit uh, movie. And the question I asked them is why is it that uh, Americans can only discuss these issues in the context of a fictional ca cartoon setting? Why can't we sort of look uh, more cold, uh, uh, coldly at uh, what really happened? There were some bad uh, things that went down with uh, taking down the interurban and the streetcar uh, systems. Um, I think the auto industry has its own problems right now. You know, they've been bankrupt uh, no, recently and uh, uh, some of them aren't doing so well uh, again. Uh, so I don't think they're quite the, the uh, monolith uh, that will steamroll any uh, developments in, in this uh, area the way they did, uh, say, in the 1950s. Can we protect trains from serious earthquakes? Well, the Japanese, again, perfect safety record and even more uh, earthquakes uh, than here, uh, unfortunately, for, for everyone. Um, you know, they've had terrible tragedies because of earthquakes and tsunamis in Japan, but there was no, no fatalities on their high-speed system. There's sensors in the ground and there's enough time, not much, but um, you know, a few seconds, once the sensors go off, the power gets cut immediately. Since it's an electric system, it's very easy to do, unlike an independent diesel system where every operator would have to shut down. They just pull the switch, the power goes off, the train stops, and then the tracks shake and uh, you know wiggle and stuff, but the trains aren't moving fast uh, when that happens. So that would be something you would definitely, if the, the higher, I'm sure the, the high-speed system in California will have that type of uh, sensor technology built into it to automatically stop the system. And if you do that right, uh, it's quite safe. Would you speak about the utility transportation concept using, including electricity, water, uh, fiber optic, et cetera, uh, within the rail corridor? Well, sure, you know, uh, corridors are extremely valuable uh, for multiple uses uh, because it's so hard to make more of them uh, out there. I mean, uh, anytime you try and build uh, high tension wires, pipelines, anything, uh, you're going to get, in, in new build uh, situations, you're going to get years of, uh, times decades of protests, legal challenges, et cetera. Uh, out there. So you have this rail corridor and you're looking for money, you know, how, where's the money going to come from to redevelop it? Well, if you can find people who want to move electricity, water, uh, other uh, uh, fluids through pipelines uh, underneath it, you've got a way to uh, raise uh, revenue um, to help uh, rebuild that uh, infrastructure. I was saying to one gentleman before uh, the lecture, this could be a way to get a free electric uh, uh, rail system. Uh, just, um, you know, we're going to need, uh, if we have a smart grid system, there's going to be need to have more 
capacity to move um, electricity efficiently around the U.S. And the U.S. Uh, electric grid needs a lot of um, upgrades uh, that way. I think it would be a lot easier to electrify your rail corridor by having some electric uh, utility build uh, the transmission lines and then just have a step down uh, line which they build for free along the way uh, for your trains to run on and maybe give you a break on the power uh, as well. So you could, you know, imagine things like that uh, uh, happening and uh, you should definitely be thinking about multi-use. The more you can put into that corridor that's compatible and safe, uh, the less you're going to need to tear up your open spaces in other parts of the county to put in that infrastructure. So it's another way, it's a bit like density and uh, development. By having the density concentrated around train stations, you're preserving open space in other places rather than sp spreading it evenly everywhere. So same thing with these uh, uh, utility corridors. Okay. Uh, two class questions. Um, did you say that 130 miles of high-speed rail track can be built in the Central Valley for 5.8 billion? That's what the current budget uh, is. Okay. Uh, and of course, the longer the uh, uh, suspects, the usual suspects tie it up in court, uh, the, the more the inflation factors will kick in. Um, I think they're counting on tying it up long enough so that it's hopelessly uh, over budget uh, along the way. But um, yes, uh, 130 miles for 5.8 billion is the current uh, plan. That's to build uh, the uh, electric infrastructure. That doesn't include the trains that would uh, run over it. But um, that's the plan. And what's the annual cost to taxpayers to subsidize Amtrak? Um, it's in the billion dollar a year range, give or take. Uh, and um, you know, Amtrak's been around uh, a while now, and I wrote a book before this one called uh, New Departures, where I called Amtrak uh, a name that not everyone liked. I said it's a policy blocker. Amtrak was never really designed to solve a problem. It was kind of designed as a stopgap to avoid solving a problem because people couldn't agree on what to do about the decline of the passenger rail uh, system. They still can't agree, so Amtrak is sort of chewing that uh, billion up uh, every year. And it's added up. I mean, you actually could have built uh, some uh, high-speed rail in the U.S., uh, but um, that would have involved uh, letting go of a lot of other train uh, operations. But as long as the debate every year is about do we keep Amtrak or do we get rid of it, we'll never get to this new model railroad uh, because that's what really is the alternative. You, you need, instead of having all Amtrak or no trains, uh, the future, I think, that California might show people is, well, you can have better train model uh, that works and then we can sort of evolve Amtrak. Amtrak was meant to last five years. That was the original, you know, design life of the organization. It was supposed to be a transition mechanism. It wasn't supposed to be here and it really has struggled and uh, we've all paid for that uh, one way or another. Uh, funding question. Can Prop 1A funds pay for a spur from Santa Cruz to Gilroy? Um, I'm pretty sure that it, they can't. Uh, there's not going to be enough of that money uh, to build even the parts that they, they said they wanted to between Southern California and the Bay Area. But I think, you know, again, talking about leverage, it's getting the uh, uh, sort of uh, close uh, by infrastructure that uh, those billions and federal money are going to go into. And uh, the big question would be, you know, sort of uh, connecting up uh, uh, with it. Um, maybe you won't be doing it uh, with a bullet train initially, but more like a, a light rail uh, uh, connection, and then sort of see where that goes over time. And one last question, Anthony. Save this one for the very end. Okay. Did you have model trains as a kid? Um, I, I've, I've uh, never been that uh, dexterous with uh, my hands, and I tell people that, you know, well, that's why I was always interested in the real ones, uh, uh, because uh, it was sort of a scale that I could handle uh, uh, working with. So um, that's, that's my story, and uh, thanks uh, so much for coming out, everyone. All right, thank you.